We're going to consider two diseases in this talk, axenfeld reeker syndrome and Peter's anomaly. axenfeld reeker syndrome is a rare disease that has both anterior segment and often systemic findings. The etiology in the eye of these changes is speculated to be an arrest of anterior segment development, latent gestation, there are membranes that represent re retained primordial material, and the glaucoma is due to compacted trabecular meshwork beams, much like what we see in primary congenital glaucoma. It's a bilateral disease, usually dominant, and there's no gender predilection. There are two known genes for axenfeld rieger syndrome that are worth knowing, PIDX2 and FOXC1. Like a lot of these developmental abnormalities, and we'll see this in Peter's anomaly too, glaucoma develops in about half of the cases, and it typically develops in late adolescence or early adulthood, although I've certainly seen people with axenfeld rieger syndrome and cloudy corneas at birth. The risk of developing glaucoma is related to how high the iris inserts into the angle, not to the number of iris processes or the degree of iris abnormality. An example is this patient of mine who has axenfeld rieger syndrome with really no iris changes other than some hypoplasia and the angle looks pretty normal. We know that the patient has Rieger syndrome because they have systemic findings and they're a member of a family with axenfeld rieger syndrome. If we'll walk through the clinical findings. We see posterior embryotoxin. I underlined O there because it's toxon, not toxin like poison. You can see that here. It's, a anterior, it's described as an anteriorly displaced Schwalbe's line. It is a ring that is visible on slit lamp examination. While it's described as a Schwalbe's line, I, I really disagree with that, but if you're asked this question on a test, that's the answer, anteriorly displaced Schwalbe's line. One can see posterior embryotoxin up to 15% of normal eyes, but having said that, it's not a startling embryotoxin like this. It's just evidence that you can see the anterior border of the trabecular meshwork if you do a really careful examination. So while we say it's up to 15%, you know from your clinical experience that 15% of your patients don't have this line that you can see on the right side of the slide. By itself, you can have embryotoxin and not have any risk of glaucoma. So this is just another view of posterior embryotoxin right there. This is an, a normal eye with embryotoxin, but no axenfeld rieger syndrome, no glaucoma. You can see the embryotoxin right there, and you can see a little bulge on the anterior segment OCT. This is a Lee Allen painting, and, and all of his paintings are actually made from real patients. Uh, and, and you can see here that the corneal wedge comes together behind this embryotoxin. So uh, in my mind, it's not Schwalbe's line, but, but again, that's the conventional wisdom. Just another picture of posterior embryotoxin here. You can see this glistening ring uh, in the cornea. And some pictures from Rob Honkin and showing that, again, this glistening uh, ring of collagen in the cornea, and you can see iris processes up to that ring. This is a patient who has a broken embryotoxin, so uh, it has broken free into the anterior chamber. You can see the end of it there that's still attached. So sometimes these are really very, very central or quite a ways from the limbus, and they can they can break. This is the gonio view of the same patient. And here's that broken posterior embryotoxin.
This is a trabeculectomy specimen um, from a patient of mine who has posterior embryotox. And you can see this uh, ring of collagen here with iris hanging off of it. It's actually a really cool picture. But also notice that in this PAS slide that decimase travels right over this. And again, in my mind, implying that we're not looking at Schwalbe's line, but something anterior to Schwalbe's line. You see iris processes and a high iris insertion. Again, this is, you can see the corneal wedge coming together behind that ring. And, and this is a patient with lots and lots of iris processes. Just another view of a, of a photographic view of a similar patient. This is a young patient of mine who's in her teens, had surgery when she was a baby. You can see she has iris hypoplasia. And just a really interesting gonioscopy exam, a really marked greater circle of the iris. You can see her posterior embryo toxin here, lots of iris processes. We move back to the iris, you see hypoplasia, and you can see varying degrees of this. It can be quite subtle on the left, and then more marked in these other two pictures. One can get correctopia, and often uh, that seems to be directed at accumulations of this primordial material in the angle. Two more examples of correctopia, and you really get the sense that there's material here that's pulling on that pupil. One can develop polychoria, where extra pupils develop, as we can see inferiorly in this young patient. Iris changes usually seem to be stationary, but there have been um, reports of progressive iris changes. But whatever changes occur are, are generally slow. This is just somebody with mild axenfeld rieger syndrome. You can see the posterior embryo toxin right here. And on gonioscopy, you can see the embryo toxin, and then you can see the iris processes going up to it. Really striking embryo toxin there. This is a young patient who has marked iris deformities. And he really didn't develop glaucoma until he was late in his teenage years. He was really quite normal up until then. And then unfortunately developed very uh, relentless glaucoma that's required multiple surgeries. There are systemic features. One can have mid-face flattening, maxillary hypoplasia, telecanthus hypertelorism, and a broad, flat nasal bridge. This is a patient whose picture is being used with his parents' permission. Again, you can see here the maxillary hypoplasia, really quite striking. Often dental abnormalities, hypodontia, meaning too few teeth, and microdontia, meaning the teeth are small. You really have to ask because most adults who had teeth they were so abnormal, would have had dental work done and might be wearing dentures. They can have redundant periumbilical skin like this. It looks like a hernia, but it's really not a hernia. And, and the typical story is that the pediatric surgeon goes in to repair the hernia, doesn't find one, but goes in, fixes this abnormality anyway. So again, you need to ask the parents if they've ever had surgery. And in males, you can get hypospadias.
Other systemic features, pituitary abnormalities like growth hormone deficiency and empty cella. One can have heart valve abnormalities. And then lots of other things have been described, but really not often enough to be considered part of the disease. We treat it like primary open angle glaucoma. Uh, cholinergics and trabeculoplasty are not particularly useful. It's really hard, it would be hard to do trabeculoplasty in somebody whose angle is so abnormal. In babies, uh, one can try trabeculotomy. Uh, goniotomy would be a challenge generally if there's a lot of iris processes. When you look at a two-dimensional photograph, Ice and Rieger look very much the same. You see multiple holes in the iris, these areas that are thin, which are atrophic in ice and hypoplastic in Rieger, meaning that they never did develop. They can be progressive. And really, in two dimensions, they look very similar. But they should never confuse you in your exam room when you have a living patient. Ice is unilateral sporadic, acquired, usually in early middle age. There's no embryotoxin. The corneal endothelium has hammered silver appearance. The iris is atrophic, which does look like the hypoplastic iris of Rieger, and there are no systemic features. In distinction, then, Rieger is bilateral, autosomal dominant, present at birth, although it can change in a few patients, there is an embryotoxin, there's no hammered silver endothelium, and there often are systemic features. So while a two-dimensional image might confuse one, a patient in your exam room should not. I prefer calling the whole thing Axenfeld-Rieger syndrome. Uh, there are people who split it into Axenfeld anomaly, Axenfeld syndrome, Rieger anomaly, Rieger syndrome, but I think these terms are confusing. Axenfeld syndrome is Axenfeld anomaly with high pressure, whereas Rieger syndrome is Rieger anomaly with systemic features. So I would just call the whole thing Axenfeld Rieger syndrome. You also see uh, other names for this, like iridocorneal dysgenesis and mesodermal dysgenesis, which is actually a misnomer since it's neural crest derivation. I'm going to show just two cases that kind of highlight why I think it's good to lump them together. This first case is, is a little boy I saw at birth with cloudy corneas, very high pressures, found to have angle abnormalities, but no iris changes, no dental or umbilical changes. But he has telecanthus, as you can see here. He had growth retardation for which he took growth hormone. He was born with no internal carotid arteries, which is fascinating, and I don't know that that's part of axenfeld rieger syndrome. It's pretty unusual. He has a FOXC1 mutation, as does his dad, but in his, in his dad, all we see is one clock hour of posterior embryotoxin with the strand of iris going up to it. He has normal pressures, and everything else about his eyes are normal. Another case is a patient with classic Rieger anomaly, but with normal teeth and umbilicus, also a FOXC1 mutation. But he has family members with Axenfeld anomaly, Rieger syndrome, you can see the teeth of one of his family members here, and Peter's anomaly. So because of all that, there's an overlap between disorders and multiple disorders caused by mutations in a single gene. To me, it's best to lump all these people under axenfeld rieger syndrome. Let's move on to Peter's anomaly. So if axenfeld riegers is rare, this is even rarer. These are children who are born with the central corneal opacity called the leucoma. Their endothelium of the cornea fails to develop properly. And sometimes this is associated with cataract. And when there are only corneal changes, sometimes it's called the internal ulcera von Hippel, although that's a term I never use. Sometimes they can have angle changes suggestive of axenfeld rieger syndrome, but I don't think it's helpful to consider them as one disease. It's sporadic. 
which means it may be autosomal recessive, uh, it's rarely dominant. So usually in, in the U.S. anyway, it, it occurs as a sporadic disease. And interestingly, mutations in all of the, the genes that cause anterior segment abnormalities have been reported as isolated cases for Peter's anomaly. It's usually bilateral, but 20% of the time it's unilateral. And glaucoma, again, in 50%, and the mechanism is really not clear. So the most important sign is the corneal opacity, as you can see here in this unilateral case. You can see that there's very dense corneal opacity centrally, but peripherally out here you can see the iris, so the peripheral cornea is clear. Sometimes cataract, obviously the view in through that cornea is not very good. You can have iris strands from the collarette up to this uh, leucoma. There are no consistent associated other findings. This is a little patient of mine. She actually has a Axenfeld-Rieker syndrome in her left eye, had a trabeculotomy, that eye is doing great. But her right eye has a central opacity and on ultrasound you can see that the lens is right up in it. And this is a histopath slide, there's, there's no corneal endothelium here. They often require surgical glaucoma management. They require early penetrating keratoplasty to prevent amblyopia. So the key points for Rieger, Axenfeld-Rieger syndrome, it's a bilateral disease, glaucoma in half the patients. Glaucoma is not related to the iris and angle abnormalities. Two genes, PIDX2 and FOXC1, and often with uh, systemic findings. Peters Congenital central corneal opacity is very rare, usually bilateral, glaucoma in half. And cases are reported associated with all of the developmental glaucoma genes. And the biggest concern in these patients is amblyopia. So two rare diseases, but very important that you recognize them and know how to approach them.